Tonight, I can report Bob Mueller's probe will continue beyond this week. Now, we don't know that because of Bob Mueller, whose office has been silent, even as those rumors circulated last week that Mueller was nearly done, and even as CNN and The Washington Post reported on the clues for those rumors, and even as some analysts you may have heard speculated about a Mueller report that could be, quote, days away, Mueller's office stayed silent. And like many, many reporters, I checked in with Mueller's office during that news cycle to basically see if they wanted to add any context or comment, and they declined. The only reason we can even report that Mueller will go past this week is that his new boss, Attorney General Bill Barr, had the DOJ announce late Friday Mueller will go past next week. And that mini episode reinforces how unlike some chattier people in law enforcement, say Ken Starr or James Comey, there are actually only two sources of first-hand information that we get about the Mueller probe. The filings, the material he releases, and the information released by people who interact directly with Mueller. Witnesses, defendants, and their lawyers. That's it. If you want hard intel on the probe, things that people saw or experienced, you need those witnesses or their lawyers. And that's why on The Beat, we turn to people with first-hand experience whenever possible, regardless of what one thinks of their politics or their choices. You may remember we interviewed Sam Nunberg the day he vowed to illegally defy Mueller. He later backed down. But we interviewed him because he was a first-hand source. We interviewed two Roger Stone associates who described potential crimes by Roger Stone. Mueller later indicted Stone for some of the very allegations they made on live TV. And we also convened the first joint summit of Mueller witnesses to learn what they told Mueller and how the probe was going. Each of those people had inside knowledge. In the law, they're called fact witnesses. Mueller's team spent dozens of hours with those witnesses to learn about anything they might have seen, and even more time with guilty witnesses who flipped to share information on what they did. Now, as the DOJ hints that Mueller may be nearly done, again, public information about the probe is still stubbornly limited to those two sources, Mueller's filings, and what those witnesses and their lawyers experienced. It's rare to hear from those witnesses. It can be even rarer to actually hear from their lawyers who are the type of people, the type of counselors who often stay behind the scenes while a probe is open and while their client's fate may not be completely resolved. Now this probe does appear to be closer to closing, which may be part of why we are able to do something truly unusual tonight. We are holding the first joint interview of lawyers who faced off against Mueller in the current Russia probe on live TV. It's the first time we'll hear from representatives of guilty ex-Trump aides who flipped, along with representatives of other witnesses, to get some first-hand insights into the questions roiling the nation that could determine the future of the Trump presidency. Here we are doing the first joint TV interview on live TV of the lawyers who have faced off against special counsel Mueller with first-hand insights into these big questions. Joining me tonight is Caroline, Caroline Polisi, who since last September has represented George Papadopoulos, the first ex-Trump campaign aide to plead guilty in the Mueller probe. Jim Walden, who represents a former director at Cambridge Analytica, Brittany Kaiser, which served as a digital uh, campaign entity for the Trump campaign. Mueller's interviewed Kaiser. Dennis Vacco, who represents former Trump campaign aide Michael Caputo, who was interviewed by the Mueller team. And Anne-Marie McAvoy, who represented one of the most pivotal figures in this entire case, the former Trump deputy campaign chair, Rick Gates, who pleaded guilty and is a cooperating witness in the Mueller probe. Uh, I'm very excited to hear from each of you. Thanks to all of you for doing this. Thank you Thanks for having us. Uh, I wonder if we could begin with a, a big question is, what did you talk about most? What did they ask about most uh, when you were in there? Um, well, it's unfortunately very difficult to discuss um, what really went on as we were representing um, our clients, uh, and certainly for me for, with Gates. As we say, um, next. <laughs> well, it, but I mean, obviously they were interested yeah. in Michael Caputo's involvement in the campaign. Uh, you know, he was there for only a short period of time, so their horizon in terms of their questions were limited to the time that he was in the campaign. Russia stuff? They were generally interested in his involvement in the campaign. Uh, there was some, you know, uh, generic questions about contacts with individuals that might have had Russian surnames. Uh, but nothing in particular with, with Caputo. I'm in the same boat as Anne-Marie in the sense that, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Pass. Uh, <laughs> do, you think, do you think based on, because everyone's going to get time. Do you think based on your knowledge of the case, not 
leaking what happened inside the room, okay. um, that they have a target or a theory of the case. I mean, we've had witnesses like Caputo say they were investigating in a very deep sense whether uh, people on the campaign were knowingly trying to collude. Well, I think they definitely have an idea of what they're looking for. And I think they also, you know, many times as a prosecutor, you not only um, have the evidence before you, but you have an idea of where you'd like to see the evidence go. And I think that it's very clear that they have a game plan as to what they're looking for. Whether they can prove it is another story. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think that they were uh, very methodical in their, in their uh, handling of Caputo and their questions. And they, they, they clearly had a game plan as far as I was concerned. And Caputo, who you represented, uh, very interestingly said he also thought part of what they wanted to do was turn people on each other. Let me play that for your response to all, everyone, really. Um, he was talking about tactics and hardball. Take a look. I believe that this is what Mueller does. Uh, he drives a wedge between old friends. He destroys relationships in the hopes that, uh, that they'll turn against each other and eventually turn evidence against the President of the United States. I know I would never do that. I know Roger would never do that. Well, you heard it directly from Michael in, in, that, in that clip. I think that, you know, from the perspective of a federal prosecutor, I mean, that's kind of prosecution 101, right? You want to you turn people against each other. You want people to give you information. You want them to be motivated to give you information. Michael has a certain view of, of the motivation behind that, but frankly, I, I see it just as prosecutors being prosecutors. You want to take witnesses, you want to take them for what they tell you, and how you can use that to leverage other witnesses. I agree with Tennis wholeheartedly. The idea, I would take it a step farther to say, the idea that they're going to personalize this when these are a group of very, very capable professionals to me is far-fetched to the extreme. You're saying that the Mueller lawyers and prosecutors you dealt with were very professional and, and you're rebutting the way Michael put it. Absolutely. And, and what they're doing is they're following the facts. They are fielding every single ground ball in the investigation and trying to be as thorough as possible. In my interactions with them, they were completely fair. They didn't come in with an agenda. Mm. They weren't trying to get anyone. It wasn't a game of gotcha. They were literally trying to follow the facts and that's what they did. And you're, well, go ahead. And if you don't mind, I, so I don't want to, Mike, comments to be reflected that I'm contradicting what Michael said. Michael is in a different position as a witness, so he goes into this very intimidating setting. All of these witnesses go into this intimidating setting, many of them for the first time. And, the, and the, even the manner in which they set up the interview, where we had to meet them off-site, we had to meet them at a, at a predetermined location, they, they drove us into the basement of the building, all under the, you know, the, the cover of secrecy. Was, all, that different, very was that different than a normal law enforcement debrief? I, Look, I was 20 years in law enforcement, uh, five in the federal government. I, I never asked a witness, except for maybe somebody involved in the mob, in a mob prosecution, to bring in a witness through that type of security, that type of secrecy. And you're suggesting the view that, at least in your case, your client, uh, that he found it intimidating. Do you think it was designed to intimidate? Perhaps. He certainly felt that it was intimidating, and then what, what unfolded beyond that was equally intimidating. You go into a room and you're talking to, to individuals that you know that, you know, if you, if you slip up, they have that 1001 capability. They have the ability to charge you you're with lying the statute to, on false sure. statements. You think that was false. effective? It's an effective tool that federal law enforcement uses all of the time. Right, and in your is, case, with George well, Papadopoulos, yeah. they swooped him right off a plane. Well, exactly. George is in a little bit of a different situation. He was sort of the first domino to fall, as people like to say. But, um, you know, I, I don't know if it was – I'm not going to say that it was, it was unethical, but they definitely used every tool in the toolbox to sort of, you know, wield their power and, and be intimidating. But that's their right to do. I mean, they had to come out really strong forcefully in the beginning to show everybody that they were going to charge this 1001 violation, which they've been sort of charging with abandon ever since the beginning of this case. They, they wanted to make it clear you can't go in there and lie to them. I will say in the case of George, you know, they initially charged him with an obstruction of justice charge as well, which is, you know, vastly more um, like a higher, a serious. higher serious than a 1001 violation. So that is a tool that they use to intimidate him to get him to plead guilty to the 1001. Well, they, I yeah. mean, so, you know, the, but these are common tools that prosecutors often use. And let's, let's be clear. Bob Mueller did not write this playbook, right? It's never yeah. the crime. It's always the cover up. These are very sophisticated people that should know that if you lie to Congress, if you lie to investigators, you're going to jail. Mike Flynn's defense of they set me up fell on deaf ears. So I think that they're doing exactly what they should be doing and uh, they're 
certainly pushing some envelopes, but crossing no lines. Did you uh, sort of exchange, hold on, did you exchange looks with Mr. Caputo? You're going down, what, underground secretly into the special counsel's building? Or did you tell him, hey, cool it, it's going to be fine? Well, I mean, I knew that, that we were in for a, a fun day, if you will, because we were told to meet an FBI agent that had pre-designed location. So when we got in the so car... So this was so that no one would know where Mueller's team actually works out of. Sure, I think... It, then part, they took it, you there. In part, it was to not uh, disclose where they are. I don't remember where we went, quite frankly, even though we walked out without uh, any security with us. But, but look, I, I want to go back hey, to Marie, the lawyers love saying they don't remember things. <laughs> I, I want to go back to the intimidation go factor ahead. for a moment. So f for a witness like Caputo, who by the time he got in front of the special counsel, he had already testified before the House Intelligence Committee, yep. and he also had, had testified before the Senate Committee. So he's already on record two times before he makes it to the office of special counsel. There's a lot of pressure on just simply witnesses. There's never been any indication whatsoever that Caputo was involved, implicated, had any substantial role other than just potentially being a witness. It's nonetheless still very intimidating. Yeah, I think when you look at how they've proceeded, there's no question, at least in my mind, they've been somewhat heavy handed with how they've handled folks. I mean, you look at how they arrested Roger Stone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Machine guns drawn, you know, breaking down the door, basically, um, with the number of people that were there. I mean, normally in a case like that, you would have him surrender voluntarily with his lawyer. He'd come and, in, you'd and, set up a time. And normally, and let me ask you this, and normally, normally in a case like that, would you have that individual having threatened to kill uh, another witness's dog uh, and then go on to threaten a judge? Would that be normal? Well, uh, first of all, the judge thing happened after, so that wasn't relevant at the time. They had no knowledge that he was going to do something like that, and it's not clear that it was a threat. But It's um, not clear that it was a threat? Well, it was a picture of her. And We've got had, Michael had, Cohen had, speaking. Hang with me. We'll get your reaction. Action. I believe Michael Cohen has uh, exited his testimony. Let's listen in. Sticking around. Have a good night. What's the president, 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 president coming in? That is a live shot. We were hoping he would say more. Obviously, he's waiting until tomorrow. Uh, let me turn back to the very special group we have here. Uh, two lawyers for Mueller witnesses and two lawyers for former Trump aides uh, who are guilty uh, and who flipped and who provided testimony. Now, you were defending, basically, the argument that's been made that they were heavy-handed. I'm pressing you on it because I think mm -hmm. it's important. Right. Uh, you're describing lawful tactics that were designed to intimidate but as well within their right. You're mm -hmm. suggesting that they overdid it. In the case of, of Mr. Stone, he was just in court uh, apologizing and begging for mercy because of what was put in the pleadings, which was basically the argument that the guy uh, has been threatening people left and right. Well, if he, with the, with the judge, if the judge had truly felt that she was being threatened and that he was really threatening people's lives, he wouldn't be out um, on the street yet. They would, she would have put him in jail, which he did not do. Um, he, but he, he's an older guy. I mean, to have that kind of almost like a SWAT team show up the way they did is much m more than they would normally do. And especially then especially, especially since they knew that he was represented. Let me, yes. let me kick yeah. around to first to Caroline. I just category, oh, one, categorically yeah. disagree with that. I, I've had many, many clients um, waking up to a very rude awakening to a knock at their door at, at 5 a.m. in the morning. That's just routinely how they do it. Gone are the days, I think, when the government treats white-collar criminals with sort of kid gloves. That is how they do it um, in normal circumstances, and I can say that because I've had regular clients that they do that with. Not to mention someone who the Mueller people may believe obstructed justice, pressured witnesses, uh, might run, has substantial resources. All of those reasons, I couldn't agree more. This happens to Americans every day in every state in the land. Do you think it's a function of being privileged and out of touch to be surprised that law enforcement yes. are tough? It's absolutely. Yes, for absolutely. Sure. That in this case. I, I don't think so. I think when you look at, for instance, also is the same sort of tactics in a way. You look at Paul Manafort, you know, the age that he is and the physical shape and that he's still in solitary confinement. I mean, this is not the way it's normally handled. And when you look at the Mike Flynn plea, they were going after his son. Um, he had no money left. I mean, they, they, they bludgeon the people mm -hmm. until they can't fight back anymore. So 
you think that Paul Manafort is in solitary and that is designed to be uh, somehow it's a punishment? Cert- it's, well, I think that there's Personal certainly safety. a possibility, let's put it this way, there's certainly a possibility that they may be doing it in the hopes that he will eventually crack. And then the question do is, does, know, he, does do you, he then do you cooperate know who, do you know who or does he make something up? Do you know who disagrees to- with you? Paul Manafort, who was recorded on a prison line, and I don't know if well, you know you or not. Very smart well, you have to let me. Hold on, you have to wait, and then you get to respond. <laughs> I don't. I know as a lawyer, you have to interrupt when there's a point that's devastating to what you're saying. Um, but that's part of my job is to give a fact, even though it's mm-hmm. devastated what you just claimed. Paul Manafort. Um, so Paul Manafort saying that he was being treated like a VIP inside prison um, and that his quote-unquote confinement includes a personal laptop, a phone, a shower, and a workroom. He's still in solitary confinement. Uh, that is something that is not normally done for somebody like him for the type of charges that he's Do you facing. think that he's okay? Well, I think it, it, in part, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, it's probably for his own security as right. well. It's the BOP's decision, sorry. Right. No, no, it's no. Not, it's not the government. Bureau of Prisons. Yes. So the other piece to all of this is uh, when you have people who actually began cooperating. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Manafort. Of course, you represented Rick Gates. They were very close. Yeah. Rick Gates ultimately flipped first. Paul Manafort was rumored to, he was going to hold out. And then he flipped. Um, did Rick Gates make the right legal call? Um, I'm not comfortable con- uh, commenting on that. I'm sorry. Do you think Rick Gates made the right legal call? <laughs> you can comment yes, on that one. <laughs> I think that, that uh, ultimately he made the, the right legal call. Let's just take, take a step back for a second and understand that these are some of the most troubling crimes that have occurred in our nation's history at the highest levels of our government being played out across the media around the world. People need to step up and provide information and help the American public understand who is running our government. Mm. And if they don't do that for self-preservation reasons or for reasons of patriotism, we all lose. And based on your dealings with Mueller's team, if there's collusion, do you think they'll find it? Yes, I think that they will find everything and more. And the flip side of that, which you may like more, as uh, you've, you've got the MAGA uh, outfit to boot. I like red. Uh, I like red, too. I like red, too. Uh, is, is when you look at this, you say the flip side, in fairness, is if this comes to a conclusion without uh, a finding of collusion, that would be good for the Trump side, yes? Um, sure. I mean, you hope, whatever side you're on, you should hope that the case should go where the evidence leads it. I mean, that's what a prosecutor, prosecutor should do, and that's what I assume that they are doing. One of the key witnesses in this entire thing that, that uh, you guys have not represented, although separately we've heard uh, from his attorney, Lanny Davis, is Michael Cohen. I showed him leaving these hearings. We have now turned a brief bit of sound of what else he said for your analysis, brand new, first time airing. Let's hear Michael Cohen today. First of all, I want to thank you all for sticking around and waiting for me. Um, at this point in time, I really appreciate the opportunity that was given to me to clear the record and to tell the truth. And I look forward to tomorrow to being able to, in my voice, to tell the American people my story. And I'm going to let the American people decide. How unusual is it uh, to have a witness like him who's waiting to go to jail? and is now going to address Congress in public tomorrow, while also this other probe remains open. For better or for worse, this is historic. I mean, this could really be uh, something that seals his fate in terms of his credibility if he's not well prepared. Knowing about Lanny Davis, I'm sure that he will be. Or it could be the beginning of the end for the president. But to be clear, he still has, you know, a dog in this fight. He's gunning for that, you know, evasive Rule 35 motion by the government that could potentially reduce his sentence. So, you know, obviously people are going to attack his credibility, saying that he lied to the very body that he's in front of now. Um, and potentially he has a motive. And, well, quite frankly, we're forgetting that not too long ago he pled guilty to lying to the very Congress <laughs> right. that he's now telling today I'm going to tell the truth to. So when is he telling the truth? When really does he tell the truth? What I want to do here, go ahead. No, as you say, we understand every single cooperator. The reason that federal law allows cooperation is because it allows people to do something bad and then repent and get leniency. So Michael Cohen also faces significant penalties if he's found to have lied before this body tomorrow. And I think that's important to keep in mind. 
But an important point, in the, in the justice system, a defense attorney has the ability to test the credibility of that witness who has a change of heart. When a witness gets on the stand who acknowledges that they previously lied, they're subject to cross-examination. I'm not so sure what the cross-examination of Cohen will be through this process. I'm going to do a lightning round before we go. Uh, basically, as quick as you can, a couple things. First, do you think uh, that when Mueller's done, he will have found obstruction? No. No. Factually, yes. I don't know. Collusion? No. No. I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Uh, what was the most important thing you learned going through this process or, or witnessed when you were inside those rooms? Uh, it's their tough opponent to go up against, the, uh, this team, the Mueller team. Tough? Yeah, very. Something that I've known for a long time, the federal government has a lot of power. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say the lack of agenda. Lack of agenda, fairness? Um, not as it pertains specifically to my representation, but I'd say as a whole, just uh, the selective outrage that it, when it comes to sort of everyday things, how the criminal justice system operates, people getting angry uh, about it when it happens every day. Well, and I think it was interesting, given that uh, you have all this unique experience, some of what you said and some of where you disagreed, and we appreciate you coming on the beat to do this together. Emery McAvoy, Dennis Facco, Jim Walton, and Caroline Polisi. Thanks to each of you. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.